when things happen, this is the emotion part of this topic, when emotions take over, sometimes, you know, there's this, there's the expression, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, you heard, maybe heard that expression. Some people don't like that, that's this fellow. And then some people repress them. And repression doesn't help either. So there's a, there's, if you repress, you can become depressed or it can then turn around and you feel, feel all pent up with this emotion and someone then becomes a bully because pent up, there's some emotion. So it's, it's something that needs to be managed properly. This isn't a way to manage it either. This is the um, self-destruction method. Maybe you know some people, I know some people like this. If they, if they, when they have a problem, they start sawing the branch on which they're sitting, and they, when they hear the branch start to crack, then they panic. And if there isn't a problem, they create one and start doing the same thing again. There's something about uh, handling negative emotions or extreme emotions in a proper way. Some of you, of course, if you're a first-time visitor, you know, you know what Bhagavad Gita is? Oh, great. Okay, great. So here's a verse from the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. And there's a discussion between Krishna and Arjuna. And Arjuna is complaining or venting or expressing, the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, very strong, and to subdue it, I think, is more difficult than controlling the wind. So what to do? In the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he says something to this effect, why do I do things that are in discord with my inner value system, as if by force it's called the mind? The mind pushes, your Value system says no, the pushing says yes, and sometimes the pushing wins. Even if it's against your value system or your power discrimination. So, again, this is a little discussion. There's two parts. I'm looking for people to volunteer. Why is it difficult to have controlled mind and steady emotions? Is there a reason? Okay. Okay. It's okay. I don't think we need a microphone. I don't think I need a microphone either. What's behind it? If you think in terms of bug beginning or think in terms of practical life. Lots of desires. Huh? Lots of desires. Lots of desires. And so where do the desires arise from? If you know where the desires arise from, you might be able to shut the valve off, or at least slow it down. Not off, but down. So this is, this is a Bhagavad Gita message. You know, the, the, the beginning, that little video clip was describing parts of the brain. And the brain is a, it's a physical. But the, va the brain is handling information that's dealing with something that's more subtle than physical. It's the mind. Because emotions are carried in the mind. But according to the Vedic conception, thinking, feeling, and willing, these are functions of the mind. Thinking, and with the senses you contemplate an object, and then the information of that contemplation goes to the mind, and then you think about the information that came from the senses to the mind. And then there's some will or, you know, I like it or I don't like it, and you want to do something about it, perhaps. So it, 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 it's driven, yes, by multiple desires, but then behind the, the desire, there's the, the Vedic conception of this is false ego. That false ego means 
I think I am this mind, or I think I am the, the body, both of which are coverings of me. Do it again. I'm wearing a, a shirt. The shirt is covering my arm. And the, what's animating the arm is the soul, the self within. So there's a covering and there's a covering. Similarly, in the Vedic conception, Bhagavad Gita conception, there's who we are, and then there's coverings of who we are. And the subtle cover of the subtle coverings, the most subtle of all of them is false ego. So driving at the driver's seat is our dear friend, false ego, that says, false ego says, since I am this mind or this body, and I want to enjoy, then this is enjoyment or that's displeasure. Unpleasant. And, and so it's how do you control your false ego? Hmm. What are the consequences of having a distracted or disturbed mind? Well, we saw some of them already. You know, one of them is you're not effective and you get carried away by something and then you, you neglected something that may be more important or a value that you hold and somehow you're over there in left field doing something that's embarrassing or regrettable or something. The, so in short, from the Bhagavad Gita perspective, the real happiness, the happiness within the self, Atma, the word Atma, Atma means self. It can mean different things, but self and prasana, Atma Suprasana, is the happiness. There's no, when there's no contentment within, then your life is based on what is out there, and sometimes it's this, and sometimes it's that. You know, it's the nature of the place where we are. Spring is coming. And it wasn't too long ago, maybe 10 days ago, it was in a place where it was snowing. And now it's like, you know, it's pretty warm. Anyway, there's, there's duality, it's day and night, seasons, happy, sad, pleasure, pain, honor, dishonor, it's right in Bhagavad Gita. That's the nature of the place. So when, it's, when, the, when the configuration looks like this, wait a while, it's gonna change. And when there's change, you may like it or not like it. But it is. So the, the point I'm making is yoga is a system whereby one can fix one's attention on something and remain undistracted. That's yoga. We're, we're going to cover uh, the yoga system a little bit. Maybe you've heard of Patanjali. Anyone here not heard of Patanjali? You're not sure. Well, I yeah. You've heard his name. But you don't know so much about him. Okay. There's a, um, a statue or something like that, a carving in some, in some public place where he grew up or he did his work. And he's, um, he lived around 400 to 500 AD that my memory is correct. And he wrote in Sanskrit, he was like a big authority on yoga. So he wrote a celebrated text called Yoga Sutras, or Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Sutra, the sutra means like, it's like a password. Little code, very short, very terse, very succinct, no explanation, just a code. And he wrote these codes or sutras about yoga. And one of the definitions you'll see shortly, yoga means, yoga means, that defined by Patanjali, is controlling the mind. It's not just asanas, we'll see. What is yoga? Here's a Bhagavad Gita definition from chapter two. Bhagavad Gita chapter two. Perform your duty equipoised 
abandoning all attachment to success or failure, such equanimity is called yoga. Strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. So each of us at different stages of life, what's work for us is different, different, different. Your work right now is a little different than the rest of us. <laughs> He's responding to some text messages. Okay, so equanimity, I like the word equanimity. It appears in several places in Bhagavad Gita. Equanimity is Pandita Samadarshana. You know the first 514? Pandit, a pandit, a learned person, has equal vision. Sama means equal. Darshana means to see. They see diversity, yet they see the unity within the diversity because they see the essence or the principle of life within that's the resting place for the diversity. The diversity is one of the things that intelligence does, one of the functions of, one of the primary functions of intelligence is discernment or, um, there's a bad word people don't like, where you discriminate. That's like the bad, discriminate means you, you know, this is my shoe and it goes on my foot. It doesn't go in my mouth. But, you know, children don't have that discrimination. They, anything goes in their mouth. So when intelligence grows, then discerning capacity or discriminating capacity, this is this and that's that, becomes stronger. So when, when the intelligence is strong, when the intelligence is strong, when intelligence is fixed, it's called sthita pragya, then you're focused. That's yoga. You stay focused, you are focused, and you stay focused regardless of the circumstances going on. That's this equanimity. The, the, the purpose of this evening's time together is how to get there. How to get to where there's stuff going on, you can see what the stuff is that's going on, and you stay focused. What a blessing, huh? If that can happen. So that's the art of work. It's still perform duty. You, you do your, whatever it is your nature to do, you do it. And some people have this nature and some people have that nature. That's just fine. We have our nature, we're working according to our nature, perform your duties, prescribe duties in life. At the same time, you're focused. That's this equanimity, which is the art of all work. Here's the Yoga Sutra number two in chapter one. There's a sutra. We're going to spend some time looking at the words. Yogash is a definition of what is yoga. Yogash chitta vritti nirodha, or stopping the swirling of the mind. Yoga is stopping the swirling of the mind. That's a definition of yoga from Patanjali. And he is, you know, authority of yoga. So yoga is much more than body postures. There's an aspect of yoga in the Eightfold Yoga system is asanas. That's one of eight things, but you know, the, the purpose of all of the eight things is stopping the swirling of the mind. In, in this, just breaking down the terms, it's just four words, in yogash, yo, a definition of yoga is chittavati nirodha. Chitta in Sanskrit can refer to all three features of the subtle body. Since most of you are a little familiar at least with Bhagavad Gita, the subtle body has three parts. Mind, intelligence, and false ego. There's a gross body that we're quite familiar with, and then there's a subtle body that's... doesn't... when the, when the gross body dies, the subtle body doesn't. Or say it differently. The subtle body carries the soul to the next gross body. Or according to Bhagavad Gita, whatever the mind is fixed on, when the soul leaves the body at the time of death, whatever the mind is fixed on, the mind, the subtle body, 
carries the soul to the next destination, transmigration or reincarnation. And it's all dependent upon what the mind is fixed on. So chitta can mean all three things. In Patanjali's sutras, it's referring to the sea. And the sea sometimes has waves. And the swirling waves, that's the vrittis. Chitta vrittis, the swirling activities of the mind are meant to be nirodha, meant to be calm or checked. Yoga means to do that. It, it's, it's asanas and much more. There's a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, in this age of Kali, men all, are always disturbed. Should be a verb in there. Even when there is no cause for disturbance. So the age in which we live, that's what's going on. And there's another situation where the mind is not disturbed. It's sometimes compared to the sea or large body of water that's very calm. And the idea when the water is very calm, you can see deep, 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 deep down into the sea or into the bottom of a lake or reservoir of water. Yoga is to calm the mind to the point of goodness to be able to see to the bottom of the sea, where the very self can observe the mind with detachment and give life to it. So goodness is a little bit assumption that you have some working knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, and for those of you who don't, I'll go slowly, a little bit slowly. One of the topics in Bhagavad Gita that gets more attention than any other topic is the modes of nature. The modes of nature condition living entities. The three modes of nature are likened to the three primary colors. Three primary colors are yellow, red, and blue. When you mix the three primary colors, you get any color. You know how to mix. Similarly, all the diversity variety within this material world is made up of material nature driven by or influenced by the, these modes. So yoga is to help elevate to the quality of goodness through your food choices, through how you speak, through how you carry yourself, through the, your character, and, and everything and everything so that goodness is promoted and that state of goodness is like likened to the sea that's very calm and when the, the, the mind is calm as when the sea is calm you can see stuff deep inside the body of water I mean I have direct experience of this just a little sharing I, I, I grew up in upstate New York and uh, the place where I grew up was one of the, the Finger Lakes. You know your ge geography a little bit. So the, the lake that I lived right near, um, when it was stormy, you couldn't see anything because the, the sediment at the bottom of the lake would be churned. But when it's calm, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, you could see everything that's at the bottom of the lake. You know, snorkeling was one of the things I used to do a lot. And you can see way down when it's calm and when it's not, you can't. But the mind is like that. The mind is like the sea. Chitta is like the sea or of the mind. And when it's calm or in the state of goodness, you can see what's going on within the mind without identifying what's going on within the mind. Let's do it again. Intelligence is discrimination or discerning. So if your intelligence is strong and the mind is calm, you can, whatever's going on within the mind, you can see it like a movie on a screen and not identify with it. Your intelligence is operating, the conscious soul is operating, and the mind is whatever's going on in the mind and you can perceive it without identifying with it. 
and then start to give direction or give it real meaning, real purpose. It's called in the in the field of um, stress management. It's called redirecting the mind. And yoga helps when yoga is done properly. Why stop the swirling of the mind so you can see the true self? Otherwise, we identify with five kinds of swirlings, the vrittis, that not always, but often, they lead to suffering. But this is, this is further, by the way, Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras describes what I'm describing. I'm just making it simple. Judgmentalism, now that's not the exact Sanskrit word, but mistakes and confusion. There are Sanskrit terms for each of these. He describes functions of the mind that are in the vritti category. So to step back, and yoga is meant to check or subdue the, the vrittis in the mind. So the mind becomes calm. It, it's so functioning, the alertness is there, but one isn't distracted by the swirlings. And these are the swirlings, or the vrittis. Judgmentalism, mistakes and confusion, daydreaming and imagination, has everything to do with the modes of nature. Sleep and procrastination. I just got a letter from somebody in college that's been struggling for a year and a half and he just was sharing, I tried and I'm still struggling with procrastinating. It's just like a bungee cord. He gets it stretched out and then gets the complacent and it goes back to procrastinating. It's just a reoccurring phenomena in his life. He doesn't like it. He has big exams coming up, and he's afraid that he's going to, you know, procrastinate when the big exams come. So he's, he's imploding in the emotional level even before his exams come due to this vritti of sleep and procrastination. And then another common one is memory that conditions us to certain types of behavior or emotional reactions. Now this, uh, this, this past weekend, I had a really nice time. I was with a, a, a group of people that never had any contact with Bhagavad Gita or anything. They just, but it was body, mind, spirit. They knew it was yoga, and there was a farm, knew there were cows, get out in the country, fresh air, and like unwind. It was nice, Easter, Easter weekend. So we spent some time on this, and one of the things that was very clear from the audience participation is one of the things that drives our emotions and our behavior is past impressions that, are, that we don't necessarily know where they're coming from or what particular events were there, but they're driving our emotions and our behaviors. It just grips the parasympathetic nervous system controls. So, so here's an example, one of the things we discussed. Somebody works at 1-800-SUICIDE hotline. I know some people that have volunteered for that. They got some training and then they do that. So someone called this lady saying, um, I'm, co I'm contemplating suicide. Really? What happened? My boyfriend didn't answer my phone call. How many times did it happen? Once. You're committing, you're, you're contemplating suicide. So because of her training, she just remained calm and she explored with the person what her background is. And it turns out her background was from a broken family. And so what was gripping her was the fear of abandonment. The trigger was her boyfriend didn't answer her phone call. So it's like, Somebody's been a fire, and they see a match. And seeing the match reminds them of the big fire in which they nearly died. And all they need is to see a little match, and it's, their parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, takes over, 
and they get extremely emotional, they can't control it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's an example of impressions or memories that are stored and some vritti, some swirling may start to happen because of that past impression. It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, fear and, you know, gripping like that, but behaviors can be just mindless behaviors that have everything to do with something that's a memory stored and we're just doing the same thing and doing the same thing. You probably have some, some relationships with people that have that happening in their life, and it's good to know there's, there's things that are helpful to help them not be gripped by that emotion. But, you know, this topic is how yoga and that yoga properly done can take one beyond that stage of the swirling of the vrittis that are disturbing the mind. There's the Yoga Sutras by the number. What you just saw is like six Yoga Sutras in one. Seven. So, helpful is to know who you are. And according to Bhagavad Gita, we're transcendental beings. Bomb proof, fire proof, water proof, wind proof. It doesn't say it quite like that, but the soul is, cannot be moistened by water, withered by the wind, burned by fire. It's not material, in other words. And that's who we are. And if we forget who we are, then we start to identify through our dear friend false ego with something that we're not. And when you're thinking that you are something that you're not, it's called crazy. Or you're influ under the influence of illusion. And you're not in touch with the happiness that's within. Instead, you're looking for happiness somewhere in La La Land where it's supposed to be nice, but it's not always nice. It doesn't meet your expectations of what's supposed to be nice. So in the Sanskrit word, it's swa rupa. Swa means one's own, and rupa means form. That, you know, the, the soul actually has spiritual form. The body obviously has form. Sound has form. We discussed this this past weekend. Sound has form. And more subtle is the soul, and that's the true self. The pure soul appears to undergo the experiences of the body and mind through the agency of false ego. Birth, death, disease, old age, happiness, distress, peaceful, anxiety, etc. But these are transformations. The agency is the false ego, and the false ego works through the mind. There's our friend, false ego. Relating to self-awareness, self-identity, self-conceit, it ties the soul to the mind and its rittis, or its swirling, or its waves. So what to do about that kind? The false ego tendency. It's a problem. It's a problem. There's the false ego guy in the middle, not that the other persons don't have one. So this is, a, this is a group discussion. I hope you don't mind doing something like this. It's going to take, I'm going to allow a good amount of time. 15 minutes is a good amount of time. We'll take less of the time if I get a sense that you, you wound up. Here's three topics. What are the various designations you identify with? What makes it difficult to let go of the external designations? And then close your eyes and imagine you can shed those identities and consider yourself a spiritual being, although tiny, an entity within the universe and the agent of love and service. And how would that feel? What would you do? This isn't doing yoga yet, it's just what's at the other end. When you get on board the yoga train, where's it going? What's the destination? And why get on board? What are the, some of the obstacles? So, the recommendation, it can be smaller or whatever you like, groups of four, discuss it in your group, and then I'll ask you, you know, someone in your group, if you want to report, like, the summary of what your group discussed 
in a short form. Clear? So, take it away.